Okay, so today we're going to talk about burns. Um, this is burn week. Uh, it's going to be really fun. So the, let's first talk about the types of burns, and they're classified by the depth of the burn and how deep they are into the skin. We used to classify them first, second, third, fourth. Um, that doesn't really work anymore because there's two different subtypes of second degree burns. So we, we title them a little bit differently based on what part of the skin or how deep they are. So our superficial burns, um, they're going to have pain. <laughs> It'll be red, dry. Um, they'll be hot. They usually blanch. Um, they should blanch. If they don't blanch, then they're not a first degree burn. Um, they're not a uh, superficial burn. Excuse me, superficial. Um, they won't have blisters and it usually takes them six days to heal. So they don't peel, right? None of that. It's just that superficial layer. All right, now we get down deeper into partial thickness. Um, and in partial thickness, there's two subtypes and it's based on how deep the burn is. So the superficial partial thickness, um, usually can't tell, um, you have to wait about 24 hours for all of the blisters to heal, to form. And so it takes about 24 hours for the, all those blisters to make themselves. So at first you might think it's just a superficial, but then in that first 24 hours, you might get some blisters forming. Um, so the hot pain blisters, it'll be red and hot. It should blanch. So when we blanch something, you push on it and then the color comes back, right? When you let go. Um, and it will take up to 21 days for these types of burns to heal. Okay, so these blister. Now we have deep partial thickness. They damage all the way down to the hair follicle in the skin and the um, sebaceous glands. They respond um, to pain with usually just with pressure only. Um, they do blister. Um, they probably won't blanch or if they do, it will be really sluggish. So these guys usually don't blanch, or if they do, it's kind of sluggish. They take up to nine weeks to heal, anywhere between two to nine weeks, and possibly with surgery. They'll need um, skin grafts and other things. Um, they also can form hypertrophic scars or keloids, um, and that is that it, it appears like a, um, kind of like a, a worm under the skin, that's what it kind of looks like, but it's that um, hyperproduction of scar tissue that can happen with these types of burns. It, they usually appear white and leathery at the very onset. All right, so now we get down into our full thickness burns. Um, they usually don't have a whole lot of pain, or if they do, it's really minimal. Um, their skin's usually pretty dry. It has a waxy white appearance, um, or it could be charred black. They usually don't blanch, and uh, they do not blister. Um, and now we get down to deep tissue, and so down, now we're down to the muscles and the bones. So full thickness, you're usually to the fascia, and then down here, you're to the muscle, bones, and tendons. Um, so most of these will require surgery. All right, so how do we treat the burns? Okay, so we want to use sterile gloves when we're touching them um, for partial thickness and worse. So basically anything that's blistered and then ruptured, you're going to want to be using sterile gloves to touch them because that skin underneath hasn't seen the light of day, right? And it should stay uh, sterile so we don't give it an infection. Um, you might need to use a burn sheet depending on how extensive their burns are. And so you might need that burn sheet under and over the patient to kind of keep them covered and keep them sterile. So um, initially we tell people at home to soak, it, soak their burns in NS or uh, tepid water. Um, in the hospital, we're gonna say NS and it's usually that first 15 minutes post burn. Just remember the longer you soak them, uh, then the more damage potentially you can do. So you wanna do that just kind of short term. And then we remove their clothes because the longer that you keep their clothing on, then the more tissue damage you're gonna create. So um, for instance, if I spill hot coffee in my lap, um, that scalding water, if it stays on my skin longer, then it's going to burn deeper. So I want to get clothes off first so that um, I can minimize the amount of damage that's happening in my tissues. Because the longer it stays on your clothes, the longer it's going to burn. So yeah, you need to remove those clothes. Um, jewelry, specifically rings, um, rings don't really allow for swelling. So you've have, if you have burn to the, burns to the hands, you're going to want to get those rings off before you can't get them off and you have to use a ring cutter. Um, we want to use 
uh, cover cover them usually first. And so the first thing you want to put on them is bacitracin. And we like to do bacitracin on the face. You can use bacitracin anywhere. The thing with silvadine, you silvadine's great for a burn cream, but you just can't use it on the face because it tends to stain the face gray. Um, so we do a really thick coat of whatever you're using, but just make sure that you don't use silvadine on the face. Um, we do adaptic xeriform gauze or Vaseline soaked gauze. And when you're putting your ointment on, whatever you choose, make sure it's a nice thick coat. And then you're going to want to put adaptic or Vaseline soaked gauze. You don't want to do dry gauze on a burn because then it's going to adhere to that skin and then re-injure it when you go to change the dressing. It'll, um, yeah, adhere to it. So, and then we want to cover them with bulky dressing, Curlix, some sort of wrap. Okay. And then ask them about their tetanus status. We want to give them a tetanus shot with partial burns. So partial thickness burns and worse. So anything that's broken the skin. So now if we have a blister, that's a partial thickness. And so uh, we want to make sure they have their tetanus up to date. As long as they've had one within the last five years, they're fine. And that goes the same with lacerations. So if you've had a tetanus in 10 years, then you have to get updated and we need to do that. Um, so the tetanus is usually good for 10 years. Um, but if you've been burned or you have a disruption to that first layer of skin, like with a laceration, then you have to have a tetanus shot within the last five years. Okay. Give them lots and lots of pain meds. It will probably take quite a bit to get them feeling a little bit better just because the pain is so severe. All right. All right. So blast injury stages. Um, the first thing you're going to have, and this is with any blast injury. So explosions, um, anything like that. You're going to have a flash burn first, and that's the initial explosion. Then they have a concussive wave or the sound wave that happens and that damages their hollow organs. They have a penetrating injury, potentially, with whatever was in the explosion is gonna be propelled out and then potentially get into the patient. So shrapnel, knives, whatever, um, sharp objects. Um, then the patient gets thrown, and so then they have um, risk of blood trauma, and then the burns are what we have to deal with afterwards as well. So patients that are involved in some sort of blast or explosion are also trauma patients because of that time when they get thrown and the concussive wave that potentially damages their hollow organs. Um, we want to make sure that we um, are aware that they will have burns. They're going to have heat burns, chemical burns, if there were chemicals in the explosion, and then they're also going to have potentially smoke inhalation burns. Uh, damage to their airways. Um, the life-threatening things we need to worry about with burns, so things that are going to kill us rather quickly, um, you have first and foremost your airway threats are going to kill you the quickest because if you lose your airway you won't be able to breathe and then you die quicker. Um, so that ha takes place with smoke inhalation. So signs and symptoms of that are black around the nares or black around their mouth. Um, they might have a hoarse voice. They might initially just have black around their nose and mouth and be speaking completely fine. Once they get that hoarse voice, you have minutes before that airway is going to close up, um, before you're not going to have an airway anymore. So that's where intubation comes in. Um, we preemptively intubate those people so that they don't uh, lose their airway and then we don't have to do some sort of emergency you know, surgical airway. Um, and this is called rapid sequence intubation or RSI. RSI is any sort of intubation that takes place outside of the OR or any sort of intubation that's happening on an emergent basis. So in the OR, most of those intubations are a, a scheduled thing and they're in a controlled environment. And so RSI is intubations that happen outside of the OR. So um, we pre-oxygenate them with a non-rebreather at 15 liters or possibly if they're unconscious, you're going to be... Um, bagging them with an on, with a uh, ambu bag and then um, also a lot of anesthesiologists will tell you or a lot of CRNAs will tell you to have a nasal cannula in the patient's nose so that when they're doing the intubation they're still getting that a little bit of oxygen while that intubation is happening. Um, we usually administer some sort of pre-med or some sort of calming medication if the patient's awake. If they're not awake we just go for it and we don't you typically don't give uh, a calming medication. Um, 
So this doesn't really sedate the patient, but it just kind of calms them down so it's a little bit easier to accomplish the intubation. Um, we typically use Versed for this, and a, a normal adult dose for Versed for like a RSI would be two, one to two milligrams of Versed. It doesn't knock them out, but it just calms them down a little bit. Um, then the sedation med is given, and the pre-calming med isn't always given, so that's very provider dependent, situation dependent. Um, then the sedation med is given, and a lot of times they like to use Atomidate or Ketamine, um, and then they'll maintain them uh, with the sedation with usually a propofol drip or um, something, or a Versed drip as well, um, either or. And then we give the paralytic medication. So that's usually rocuronium, vecuronium, um, succinylcholine. Um, however, be careful with succinylcholine because it does induce hyperkalemia. It can worsen hyperkalemia. And so um, with, with burns, you're dealing with hyperkalemia potentially. And so we, with burns, they typically don't do succinylcholine, okay? Um, succinylcholine is also the medication that causes the malignant hyperthermia um, in certain patients that are genetically predisposed. So, um, all right, now we wanna verify the tube placement with the CO2 detector, the color change on the CO2 detector. So usually it will change from yellow to purple or depending on what equipment your facility is using. Um, you're going to have your end tidal CO2 detector um, or end tidal CO2 monitor on them and you know it should be between hopefully 35 to 45 but hopefully in the 30s um, and then we're going to be auscultating both sides of their chest to make sure that we have equal chest rise on both sides and then you confirm a definite uh, placement with a chest x-ray because sometimes you'll write they'll write main stem that ET tube and so they might have to pull it up just a little bit Okay, now fluid imbalances are other life-threatening risks with burns. So um, particularly hypovolemia and then hyperkalemia. And with burns, you have a major fluid shift um, because we have injury to the tissues. And so all the fluid leaves the vessels and goes out to those tissues to try to help out. And so then you end up being hypovolemic because of it. Um, and then hyperkalemia, because we have damage to those tissues, so then the potassium leaves the cells and goes into the serum. So that's how you get hyperkalemia. All right, now infection and sepsis, obviously, because if we have, depending on how bad the burns are and how deep they are, um, now you have opened up a route for infection because we don't have that skin barrier to protect us anymore. Okay, now, the rule of nines, this is really where it gets kind of fun, um, how to calculate the total body surface area in percentage that's burned, okay? Um, so there are a lot of different formulas um, or charts that providers use. Um, the Lund Browder chart um, is a lot more detailed than this one and gives them a lot better idea of fluid replacement so we don't overfluidate people. Um, but this is just kind of a basic uh, rule of nines is, is very general, and so it's um, used more in regular emergency rooms, and then the Lund Browder chart is, is used much more in burn centers to get an exact number. All right, so it's based on nines, so everything's a multiple of nine. So the front of the head is four and a half, the back of the head's four and a half, so the whole head is nine, okay? The front of the chest is nine, the back of the chest is nine, so then the whole chest is 18. And then the front of the abdomen and pelvis is nine, the back of the abdomen and pelvis is nine, so then the whole abdomen and pelvis is 18. Your um, whole arm circumferential is nine, so the front of the arm is four and a half, the back of the arm is four and a half, gives you nine. Your whole entire leg is 18, so the front of the leg is nine, the back of the leg is nine, the whole leg is 18, okay? If you add all these up along with all your limbs, plus the groin, don't forget the groin, he gets 1%, and then um, the whole thing should total 100%. If it's not, you're not doing it correctly. Okay. So the Parkland formula is um, universally used in the US to um, determine, based on the rule of nines of the Lund Browder, um, how much fluid replacement they're gonna need for the first 24 hours. So we're just, knowing, we're just learning the 24-hour fluid replacement requirement, and you multiply the total body surface area that's burned 
by the weight in kilograms and you multiply by a factor of four milliliters. Okay? Um, we give the first half of that total of fluid over eight hours, and then we give the remainder, the second half, over the next 16 hours. So that gives us our 24 hour fluid replacement. So let's use an example patient. Let's say um, our patient weighs 132 pounds. We divide by 2.2, we get 60 kilograms. So then we plug that in. Um, but now we have to figure out what the percentage of burns they have. So let's say they've burned their entire head front and back. So that's 9%. The front of the abdomen is burned and then the anterior of the chest is burned. So it's um, 36, or sorry, 27 with the three nines. And then our left anterior arm, we'll say, is burned. So that gives us a total of 31.5% of our total body surface area that's burned based off of the rule of nines. Okay, now our 24-hour formula, so now we plug in our total body surface area, their weight in kilos, multiply by four, and we get 7,560 milliliters. So that's our 24-hour fluid replacement. This person is going to get seven and a half, a little bit more than seven and a half liters of fluid. So now we have to figure out drip rates. Cool. So you divide it in two because we're going to give the first half over eight hours, second half over 16 hours. So the first half is the 3,700. Divide that by eight, and our first drip rate is 472.5 mils per hour, or you can round up to 473. So that's gonna be our eight hour rate. Then our 16 hour rate, we're just gonna divide that, divide that by two, or you can divide that by 16. So divide the 3,780 by 16, or divide your first drip rate by two, um, similar result, or same results. So then we get 236 uh, mils per hour, and that will be our 16-hour fluid replacement rate. Okay.